the treatment talk, what you need to know about treating upper tract urothelial carcinoma, it's a presentation from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. The objectives of the treatment talks are to increase patient understanding of existing and new treatments for the spectrum of bladder cancer diagnoses, to showcase patient questions and ask about empowering patient communication with your healthcare team. How do you talk to your healthcare team about your diagnosis? And then also to highlight current treatment advances for bladder cancer. We're going to introduce Dr. Jeannie Hoffman Census and Dr. Nirmish Singla, both of Johns Hopkins Greenberg Bladder Cancer Institute. It's a delight to have you here. Thank you so much. Dr. Hoffman Census is a medical oncologist and Dr. Nirmish Singla is a urologist. So we're really thrilled to have you. And we know that upper tract urothelial carcinoma is a rare form of bladder cancer. So can one of you just tell me how often do you find bladder cancer in the upper tract in your general population? Dr. Singla, do you know how, what's the yeah. percentage of upper tract patients? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, you'll see in the coming slides. Uh, but in general, about five to 10% of, of all patients with urothelial carcinomas are found in the upper tract, and about two to 4% of patients who have had a history of bladder cancer may develop uh, upper tract urothelial carcinoma at some subsequent point. Great. So, we're going to be talking about some of the challenges of diagnosing and treating this particular rare form of bladder cancer as we go on. So I'd like to also let you know that we have Christina and Tony on this call, and they're going to share their experience going through both high risk and or high grade and low grade upper tract urothelial carcinoma. And we're going to ask them to turn their screens off. And then Dr. Singla, if you want to share your screen, I'm going to turn my cameras off and we will have your slides presented. So I'm looking forward to that. Take it away, Dr. Singla. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, and uh, thank you all for, for joining uh, this afternoon. Um, it's truly our uh, privilege and honor to be able to talk to you today about treatment options for UTUC, or upper tract urothelial carcinoma. And so together, um, both myself and Dr. Hoffman Sensitz are, uh, are We'll be more than happy to initially talk a little bit about what UTUC is and some of the background information surrounding this relatively rare entity, and then get into the weeds of some of the treatment nuances as it pertains to lower risk or low grade disease, and then the higher grade and higher risk disease states. All right, and so just to, just to begin, um, Urothelial cancer on the whole is, is actually relatively common. Uh, it accounts for approximately 81,000 new cases annually in the United States. That being said, uh, the overwhelming majority of urothelial cancer cases tend to be of the bladder cancer flavor or the uh, essentially lower urinary tract cancers, accounting for the overwhelming majority of urothelial ca uh, carcinomas. On the other hand, as I said earlier, um, only about 5 to 10% of urothelial cancers come in the upper tract flavor, if you will, or UTUC. Now, UTUC, it, it's a relatively uh, much harder population of patients to study and to treat uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, again, because of its relative rarity, it makes it uh, rather challenging to, uh, to um, come up with well-designed uh, prospective um, clinical trials uh, that allow for the generation of level one evidence to guide the management of this disease state. Furthermore, uh, whereas for bladder cancer, we have um, larger instruments uh, that we can endoscopically introduce into the bladder to get uh, good biopsy samples and, and help uh, guide management in that way, for, upper tract, uh, for the upper urinary tract, we're limited uh, with our working channels through ureteroscopes, often with a very limited diameter, to allow us to get good quality biopsy tissue that would then allow us to, uh, to direct management accordingly. Furthermore, um, in terms of staging this disease, uh, we uh, currently rely on cross-sectional imaging, typically a, a four-phase CT scan as the gold standard approach. Um, however, there are uh, many inaccuracies related to uh, staging with contemporary technology. And so this is certainly uh, an important area of need uh, and one that I think would uh, start to play a more important role as we start to uh, better uh, tailor individualized treatment strategies for patients. 
Uh, now, um, I uh, mentioned again that uh, because of its relative rarity, it becomes a challenging state to design uh, well-controlled clinical trials. Uh, in bladder cancer, we have uh, level one evidence um, that supports the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by a cystectomy, for example, in patients with muscle invasive disease. In the setting of UTUC, initially, uh, in large part, our management had been uh, extrapolated from the bladder cancer literature. Uh, now we do, uh, we are starting to have more prospective evidence emerging, and Dr. Hoffman Sensis will talk a little bit more about this in, in the second half of this talk. Uh, but uh, both for the neoadjuvant and the adjuvant, or the pre op and post operative use of systemic therapies uh, surrounding a definitive surgery, the gold standard of which is called a radical nephroureterectomy. But uh, there is one additional component to managing UTUC that's also not seen so much in bladder cancer, and that's also the fact that the gold standard treatment approach involves the removal of a renal unit, again, a radical nephroureterectomy, which um, also has implications because, as you can expect, the overall kidney function may also decline after removing that kidney. And so that also has implications for the ability of a patient to receive chemotherapy uh, following uh, surgery. Now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the staging of this disease because when we approach patients, um, when we approach patients with UTUC, there are two pieces of information that are important to us uh, to, to come up with a treatment strategy. The first is the cancer stage, and so that essentially entails the understanding of is, is this entirely a localized disease or potentially a locally advanced disease that could be managed either with procedural means or some multimodal type of an approach, or is this a metastatic uh, setting in which there are other disease uh, other uh, sites that are also involved. And then the other important piece of information, particularly for localized disease, is the grade of the tumor, is this low or high grade. And so just by way of example, I wanted to just show some, uh, some uh, CT scan images just to highlight uh, the types of uh, the spectrum that we can see uh, when it comes to UTUC. Uh, this is an example of a patient who had a uh, ureteral cancer in the distal or the last part of the ureter, which is the tube, again, that drains the kidney to the bladder. Um, circled in, in yellow, you can see that tumor. He had no other sites of disease involvement, uh, and so he was, uh, he was uh, essentially classified as a localized disease and someone who actually ultimately went on to receive uh, a multimodal approach with systemic therapy followed by a definitive surgery. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, here's an example of a patient who actually presented with metastatic cancer. Um, and so this patient had multiple sites outside of the kidney and ureter that were involved with the disease. And so you can see, for example, here um, in, in the liver, um, you, if you can see my cursor here, there are multiple dark spots that are shown on the CT scan uh, consistent with uh, metastatic deposits from its uh, urothelial carcinoma. And there's also an additional one here in the spleen. And so this is, is a patient for whom uh, surgery often will play a more limited role and upfront systemic therapy uh, would typically be the uh, next course of action. Um, so again, uh, when we talk about stage, um, there are there, the classic approach that we use is uh, using this TNM staging system. And uh, what that means is essentially we look at the primary tumor, the lymph nodes, and then the uh, involvement of distal site, of distant sites. So when looking at the primary tumor, we're most interested in assessing the degree of invasion uh, into, the, uh, into the lining or the urothelium, uh, as well as into the uh, deeper uh, tissue layers, including the muscle and sometimes even the fat uh, surrounding the, uh, um, uh, surrounding the, uh, the ureter or, or within the kidney itself. And so we assign uh, something called a T grade based on the depth of invasion. And again, this is usually based on a CT scan or an MRI that gives us this type of information. We next look at the involvement of any lymph nodes. And so we have something called the N stage, uh, which is based on the number of uh, nodes involved and also the size of the nodes involved. And then finally, we have an M stage or a metastasis stage to help us uh, understand if there are other sites of involvement, distant sites of involvement as well. Now I mentioned the, uh, the use of grade, and, and the reason why this uh, plays an important role is because, again, um, as I had mentioned earlier, we are limited in our ability to uh, get a lot of tissue when we do biopsies on patients uh, with ureteroscopy. Um, we often, in particular, uh, may not get an adequate sense of how deep the tumor is going simply because there can be sometimes risks to attempting to get uh, particularly deep samples, uh, especially within the ureter. And so, um, what our management approach has largely been predicated on is understanding what the grade of one's tumor is. 
sites. Uh, and specifically, uh, this is based on the appearance of these tumors under the microscope and is a piece of information that we can often uh, garner from these biopsies. And so uh, in particular, we either have uh, tumors that are low grade or tumors that are high grade. And this uh, will actually serve as the uh, crux of our discussion today. Um, we're gonna actually divide, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the low grade UTUC flavors and the types of management approaches that we use here. Uh, while Dr. Hoffman Sensitz will then talk in the second half of our presentation on high grade UTUC. So, specific to low grade UTUC, um, the, the good news is that uh, in general, um, even though recurrences uh, tend to be common, in other words, uh, these tumors could certainly pop up uh, despite attempts at treatment uh, in other parts of the urinary tract, the fortunate aspect is that they often uh, tend to have a low risk for progression. So the likelihood of a, of a purely low-grade tumor uh, to invade deeply or to spread to other parts of the body, uh, or in some cases even to, um, uh, to advance to a higher grade stage, often tends a higher, higher grade state often tends to be limited. And so as a result, um, whereas in the past a, a radical nephroureterectomy uh, was considered the gold standard, now um, we have increasing interest in managing these patients through a nephron sparing approach, or basically an approach in which we can avoid the need to remove one's kidney and hopefully protect their kidney function overall. And so we often will try to achieve um, control of the cancer using endoscopic means, or basically using your ureteroscope, uh, often with a laser, uh, to ablate these tumors. Uh, and that's in large part because um, over uh, because um, taking out the kidney and ureter may be considered over treatment and subject uh, patients to unnecessary uh, nephrotoxicity or kidney morbidity from having to undergo that type of a surgery. Uh, one caveat to note is that again, due to the limitations in our ability to sample these tumors endoscopically, um, if you look at some series, uh, there is actually a risk of upgrading tumors to a higher grade disease state uh, if you were to uh, undergo a nephroureterectomy for every single patient who was diagnosed initially with low grade disease. And so that's why uh, the main goals of approaching a patient in whom you suspect low grade disease would be first and foremost, uh, trying to ascertain uh, to the best of our ability, uh, an accurate sense of what the true grade of the uh, cancer is, uh, followed by a balance between preserving kidney function on the whole, but then also making sure that we are able to attain oncologic or cancer-based control. And so in terms of treatment options um, for low-grade UTUC, again, the classic approach had been to perform surgical extirpation, which would either be a radical nephroureterectomy or in a subset of patients, even a partial ureterectomy with sparing of the kidney, depending on the location of the tumor. Um, and then we also talked about endoscopic means. So this would be uh, via usually a ureteroscope um, in either a retrograde or an antegrade fashion. So a retrograde fashion being that the scope would be introduced uh, from below through the bladder, up the ureter, up to the site of involvement. And typically uh, with the use of some form of an ablative strategy, often with a laser fiber to ablate or uh, essentially kill the tumor cells, uh, or even via an antegrade approach, which involves accessing the kidney from the back and then going down uh, through the kidney and plus or minus the ureter to the destination site and treating the tumor that way. Now there is one strategy that recently uh, got FDA approved uh, that involves the use of a uh, topical installation of a, uh, of a chemotherapy agent. And this is a strategy I'll talk a little bit more about uh, referred to as primary chemoablation. Uh, and then there are also uh, indeed a number of other investigational strategies that are uh, currently um, uh, being explored uh, for this disease state as well, with the goal, again, of achieving adequate cancer control while uh, minimizing the need to remove one's kidney. So I just wanted to briefly um, highlight, without going uh, too much into the details of the study, but uh, there was essentially a, an open-label single-arm phase three trial referred to as the Olympus trial uh, that was published uh, a couple years back and led ultimately to the FDA approval of a mitomycin-containing uh, uh, reverse thermal gel. Uh, that now is marketed um, uh, by Eurogen Pharma as gel mito. And uh, the, the, way that this, uh, the way that this agent works is, um, whereas for bladder cancer, um, we have the, uh, the, the benefit of having sort of this gravity dependence where you can apply these topical therapies into the bladder um, and allow for chemotherapy to have uh, contact with the uh, lining of the bladder for prolonged duration. In the upper urinary tract, the main concern is that if you were to put a flu, uh, some sort of instill a fluid into the uh, kidney, it would likely go down the ureter and into the bladder within a very short time frame, and that would limit how much contact uh, there would be, uh, the duration of contact between the um, uh, the agent instilled and the uh, and the lining of, of the kidney and the ureter. 
And so this, uh, this concept of reverse thermal gelation was then combined with a chemotherapy agent, a commonly used for bladder cancer, mitomycin C. And uh, they essentially uh, developed this reverse thermal hydrogel polymer that means uh, at, at uh, colder temperatures, it would be in a liquid form, but then at, uh, uh, with heated conditions, such as at body temperature, it would actually form a gel. And so this, uh, this idea was found to allow for um, uh, gelation of the uh, mitomycin C for a period of about four to six hours in the human body. And so uh, as a result, this would actually allow for contact uh, between the uh, mitomycin C and the urethelium for a much longer duration of time compared to just a liquid installation alone. And so uh, when applied in, uh, in humans uh, in this phase three study, uh, they actually found that um, for uh, among 71 patients who were treated using this approach, 59% uh, of patients uh, achieved a, a complete response, which was actually quite remarkable. And of those patients, uh, 41 had entered into a follow-up period. Uh, and of those patients, um, at, by 12 months, 70% um, of patients had, had uh, exhibited a durable response. And since then, there's actually been a, a recent publication that has updated this experience as well. But based on the data shown here, and the fact that it was a relatively safe uh, agent to receive, with the main side effect being uh, the development of usually transient um, ureteric stenosis that could often be managed uh, conservatively. Uh, this ultimately led to the FDA approval for this agent in patients with low-grade UTUC. And this was actually very, very exciting in our field simply because uh, this is a very challenging disease uh, to study by virtue of its rarity. And to be able to conduct a phase three trial that ultimately led to the first FDA approval of an agent for its effective management uh, to help uh, spare kidneys, especially in those who have higher volume disease that are harder to treat uh, using endoscopic means alone, uh, this allowed for an extra uh, tool in our armamentarium to treat these patients. Uh, and so on that note, um, I wanted to just shift gears here. I'll hand it over to Dr. Hoffman-Sensitz next, who will discuss uh, high-grade UTUC. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. 